I'm not going to let the things of this world cry out in my place. But there is a new song in the heart of a child of God. That if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away and all things are become new. Let's tell the world, let the earth be silent. The wind cease to blow. Every created people to weeks. There's a new song being sung.
you are truly welcome in this place. Father, through every individual, Lord, from the back of the sanctuary to the front, Lord, we invite you, Father, to dwell in our lives, to dwell in our midst. Lord, that you would lead us, that you would guide us. Lord, direct us, Father, in the pathway of righteousness for your namesake, Jesus. For, Lord, you're our strength. You're our healer. You're the provider. Lord, you're our all in all. You're able, God, to do exceeding and abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He is worthy of all the praise. Blessed be his name. You may be seated if you can. Brother Kenny Maddox is coming to minister in song right now. I worry about tomorrow. Steps are getting slow. If you live your life for Jesus, then you don't have much further to go. For the next ten you share. for the reading of God's Word. Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. And I will be reading verse 1 through 9. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 1 through 9. The Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. And this is what he says in verse 3. He says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city, and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. They came to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I have slain in mine anger and in my fury, and for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from this city. Behold, I will bring it health and cure. 
I will cure them and we reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. And I will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for the prosperity that I procure unto it. These are the words of the prophet Jeremiah as he was locked up in prison. The prophet Jeremiah was known as a political prisoner. He had committed no crime whatsoever except to speak out against the policies of his nation's leaders as he was declaring the word of God. I'm sure if Jeremiah was alive today and living in the United States, I'm sure he could find plenty to speak out against concerning the chaos of our nation today. But as a result, Jeremiah was declared unpatriotic, and he faced an imprisonment that could have cost him his life. But even while he was in prison, Jeremiah continued to issue God's word to the king and to his national leaders. In the first verse of our text this morning, we see that Jeremiah was still in prison while he was writing this message from the Lord. And just as before, in chapter 32, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. It was during the siege of the Babylonians against the city of Jerusalem. And so now the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah again. It's the second time. He's talking to Jeremiah about a transformation, about a change that is going to take place concerning the people of Jerusalem. And it is a deliverance that only God in all his power can accomplish. How many of you know that we serve a God that is able to heal, he's able to provide, and he's able to bring deliverance? So, so this morning for just a few minutes, I want to talk to you, and I'm calling the title of this message, The Sevenfold Victory of Deliverance. The Sevenfold Victory of Deliverance. Would you lift your hands toward heaven? Let's pray and ask for God's blessing on this message. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, for every promise that's written in your word. And Lord, I pray in this message this morning that you would speak to our heart, that our life may be changed forever by the power of your spirit, God, that we would receive from the indestructible, the infallible, the inerrant, the ever-living seed of the word of God, Lord, that we may never be the same in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. The sevenfold victory of deliverance. Before this miracle of deliverance could ever take place, there were some prerequisites that was required. In other words, there were some things that had to take place before God was going to bring about a deliverance and a healing. The Lord came to Jeremiah in verse 1, the second time, and, and Jeremiah was still in prison, and God was revealing to him his plan of deliverance for the people of Israel, and specifically the city of Jerusalem. Israel had been under attack by the Babylonians, and Jerusalem had come under siege. The people of Jerusalem had been taken captive, and, and Jeremiah was there, and he was praying unto the Lord. And God showed Jeremiah his plan to deliver his people. He said that they were going to be set free from the hand of the Babylonians. But their deliverance was conditional. Two things had to happen first. First of all, the people had to call unto the name of the Lord. In verse 3, God told Jeremiah, he said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. In the New Living Translation, it says, Ask me, and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know anything about. In our own natural understanding, 
A lot of times it is difficult to understand the circumstances that we face from day to day. In the human mind, in the human thinking, we only see the immediate surroundings. If all we ever had to depend upon was what we could see right here and right now in front of us, then there would not be much to encourage us regarding some of our circumstances. That's why we need to call upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord reveals to us the bigger picture, so to speak, to help us understand that God is going to take care of us. And once we see the bigger picture, we are able to see from God's perspective. So when we call on the name of the Lord, circumstances change. Our prayer can move the hand that created this universe. In in this instance, we're calling upon the name of the Lord. It was a time of repentance. God does not want his people to perish in their sins, but he is calling for people, young and old, rich or poor, to repent of their sins. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, the Bible says that God is calling all men everywhere to repent. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this was the first condition that must be met. The people had to call upon the name of the Lord in order to be delivered. The second thing that needed to happen was that the people had to rely on God's strength. They had to rely on God's strength. The people of Jerusalem were doing everything they could in their own natural ability to try to defend their city. The city of Jerusalem had been attacked heavily. The walls of the city were severely weakened and and people were tearing down houses and, and using the materials to strengthen the walls of the fortified city of Jerusalem. But God spoke to Jeremiah. He told them that the people should call upon the name of the Lord and as a result, God was going to demonstrate his strength and his power. God was going to fight their battle. In Jeremiah 33 verse 5 in the New Living it says, you expect to fight the Babylonians, but the men of this city are already as good as dead, for I have determined to destroy them in my terrible anger. I have abandoned them because of all their wickedness. You see, a child of God does not have to worry about the battle that we face because God is the one that fights our battles. In Ephesians chapter 6, we are taught about the armor of God. Only one weapon is an offensive weapon, and that is the Word of God. That means that when we are facing a battle in day-to-day life, all we've got to do is know the Word of God and, and know what the Word of God says. That is our weapon against the enemy. So our prerequisite to victory, what needs to happen in our life before victory over every circumstance. First of all, we need to call on the name of the Lord. And number two, we need to rely on God's strength. As a result, this is going to enable us to see the victory that God has in store in our life. This is the way victory is won for every child of God when adversity strikes. If you'll remember in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible says, and they overcame him. This is talking about the power of the devil. The people of God overcame the power of the devil. How? By the blood of the lamb. It's speaking of Jesus Christ. So we overcome the power of the devil by the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross of Calvary. And not only through the blood of Jesus Christ, but also by the word of our testimony. We overcome by the blood blood of Jesus and by the word of our testimony. The word of our testimony is that we have been washed in his blood. We have been cleansed by his blood. In other words, we're not what we used to be, but we're now a new creation in Christ Jesus. We have have Jesus Christ living on the inside of us. He is the word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us and he is living in our heart and soul and when we call upon the name of the Lord and when we rely on his strength, we can live in and we can experience a victory of deliverance. In Jeremiah chapter 33, we see that there were seven things that happened when the people called on the name of the Lord and when they relied totally on his strength. First of all, when we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, we will experience the healing of old wounds. How many of you have some old wounds that you need to be healed? See, a lot of times we have this mindset that we're a child of God and and nothing bad is ever going to happen to us. But life is not always easy. 
Sometimes there is a struggle. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes there is hurt that is caused by other people. Sometimes there are people that are even hurt by others who are in the church. The people of Israel were no different. They were God's chosen people, and yet they had their share of difficulties and hurts. A lot of times when you look at the history of the nation of Israel, it's easy to see everything that they went through. They had been in slavery in Egypt, but God had set them free. They had been taken captive in Babylon. The city of Jerusalem had been heavily, heavily damaged, and it seemed for the Israelites that all hope was gone. But there was someone who did not give up. There was someone who called on the name of the Lord, and God answered them. Someone called unto God and relied on the strength of the Lord and God empowered them and so God told Jeremiah that if he would call unto him he would answer and show him great and mighty things these things would be what Jeremiah could not see at the present time Jerusalem had been wounded over and over again. There was a desperate need for these old wounds to be healed. And in the natural, it did not look like healing was ever going to come to pass. But God promised Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 6, he said, Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them. And the New Living, it says, Nevertheless, the time will come when I will heal Jerusalem's wounds. Church, we serve a God who is a healer. It is in a time of sickness that God heals. He is our great physician. He knows about all of our needs before we ever take them to him. And the word of God declares that he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us, he is also a healer of old wounds. Whether that wound is a physical wound, an emotional wound, or a mental wound, Jesus Christ Christ can bring healing of that wound. You may be wounded in your spirit from something that happened to you several years ago. Maybe you are scarred emotionally from a bad relationship. Maybe there has been a situation in your family that has brought with it division, and now you have been hurt and you have been wounded. But church, I have good news for you today. We serve a God who wants to heal your old wounds. He wants to bring about a restoration. He wants to take away the hurt in your heart and soul because Isaiah 53 verse 5 says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. When we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, we will experience the healing of old wounds. Number two, when we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, we will be blessed with prosperity and true peace. Now, I know a lot of people misunderstand that word prosperity. I'm not telling you that God is going to make you rich. I'm, that's not where we're going today. The Bible does say, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. But God blesses more than just material things. He blesses us with good health. He blesses us spiritually. He gives us spiritual strength to overcome the battle that we face of day-to-day -day life. Jerusalem had been invaded. The people had been taken captive. They were a nation that had been at war over and over again. And everything that these people had worked for was suddenly taken away from them. The people were doing everything in their own strength to try to save a city. They were trying to save a nation. They were trying to save a people. But every time it seemed that they tried to take one step forward, the devil and the enemy was just knocking them several more steps further back. But Jeremiah went to prayer. He called upon God. He remembers the covenant in which God made to Abraham that God was going to establish a nation whose people would number as the sands of the sea. And God spoke to Jeremiah and he said, Call unto me and I will answer thee. So Jeremiah called unto God and he relied on the strength of God Almighty. And not only did God bring the healing of old wounds, but verse 6 also says, And I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. God was going to prosper Jerusalem and bring about true peace. As a result, God brought the people of Israel back to their land. 
the city of Jerusalem was restored and there was peace so long as Israel remained true to God. There may be some in this room this morning, maybe some that's watching online by Facebook or YouTube and, and you're going through a difficult time and, and maybe the devil has come to try to take away everything that you have worked for all your life. You see, that's what the enemy does. It's the enemy that comes to destroy your health. It's the enemy that comes to destroy your finances. It's the enemy that comes to try to destroy your family. He tries to turn our children away from God and the devil wants to take away our peace of mind. He wants to take away our joy. He wants to take away our happiness. He wants to destroy our families and bring about division in families and in churches. You see, in recent times, the enemy, the enemy has made a spiritual attack on humanity all over this world. But trying to take away our peace of mind and replace it with fear and replace it with confusion. But the Bible is clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. You see, there is no reason for a child of God to ever be afraid. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so Jesus Christ has come to restore that which the enemy has taken away in John. John chapter 10 verse 10 the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy but Jesus said I am come that you might have life and that they might have it more abundantly we serve a God who is able to supply all of our needs in Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus so when we call on the name of the Lord and when we rely on the strength of God Almighty God is going to bring healing. He is going to bless us with prosperity and true peace. Number three, when we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, we're going to have freedom from captivity. Freedom from captivity. The people of Israel had been invaded. They had been held captive. Their land had been stolen from them by the Babylonians. And, and Jeremiah knew the promise of God. He called upon the Lord and God had spoken to him. Jeremiah had a close relationship with the Lord. He knew that God was the source of his strength and the strength of his life. He knew that the battle was not his, but that the battle belonged to the Lord. And God told Jeremiah in verse 7, he says, I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. God was going to set them free. Jeremiah put his trust in the Lord and it was God who came to set those who had been taken captive. He came to set them free. You see, that's the kind of God we serve. He is a God who sets free those who have been bound. He sets free those who have been lost in sin and he gives them strength. He gives them the endurance. He gives them the power to overcome every obstacle that the enemy tries to put in front of us. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will always raise a standard up against it. And if God be for us, who can be against us? While Jesus was here on this earth, he made it very clear what his mission from the Father entailed. In Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 21, the Bible says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears you see it makes no difference what kind of captivity a person may be dealing with a person may be dealing with some kind of an addiction they may be dealing with a battle of the mind they may be bound in a bad relationship and can't figure out how to get away 
You see, it makes no difference what kind of captivity a person may be dealing with because in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that's above every name, there is still freedom. There is still victory over every addiction. You can be free from those addictions. You can be free from being held captive in your mind. You can be free from a bad relationship. You can be free from sin. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31 through 32, he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 36 says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So when we call on the name of the Lord, when we rely on his strength, we're going to have freedom from captivity. We're going to be set free from the things of this world. We're going to be set free from the things that's holding us prisoner in our mind, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Number four, when we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, God will rebuild that which has been destroyed. He's going to rebuild everything that was destroyed. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. The people were taking materials off of their houses and they were trying to reinforce the walls of the city of Jerusalem. But the destruction was too much for humanity to battle in their own strength. But when God spoke to Jeremiah in verse 7, not only was he going to set the captives free, not only was he going to make them a nation again, but God told Jeremiah, he said, I will build them as it was at the first. In other words, God was going to rebuild them so great and so mighty that the evidence of destruction would be completely eliminated. You see, the same principle that was used for building up the people of Israel to be a mighty people of God is the same principle that works today to build up the church of Jesus Christ to be a mighty people of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If we as a church will proclaim the truth of God's word, stand on his word, live by his word, and be obedient to his word, this will be a rock-solid foundation that the church of Jesus Christ can be built upon. If we can get ourselves, if we can get our humanity out of the way, and let the limits be taken off, let the limits be taken off of our life. Let the limits be taken off of our church. Let the limit be taken off of our church ministries. And let God be God. And let God do what only He can do. God is going to move us forward. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to empower us. He's going to revive us. He's going to send about a revival. There's going to be souls that are saved. There's going to be lives that are changed. People are going to be healed. And the devil is not going to get a, a, a stronghold against the church because God said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. When we let the Lord build his church, nothing, nothing shall be impossible. In 2010, when I first started my very first day, the very first class of Bible college, at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Monday, I'd love to meet the person that set up that schedule because nobody is awake at 7 o'clock on a Monday morning. Well, back then I wasn't. I am today. But 7 o'clock is what time that class began. There's a class called Introduction to Church Planting. And the instructor, bless his heart, he had such a monotone voice. How many of you have ever heard someone who talks in the same voice and they never have expression in the way they talk and, and there's no sign of happiness, there's no sign, you know, you get the idea. It's just, it's, it's kind of robotic. And he walked into the classroom that morning and he started his lecture and, and all he said was just in a little monotone voice, he said, I will build my church. He said it again. I will build my church. And then I think the anointing of the Holy Spirit hit him because then he started having some emphasis and he said the same phrase again, but he said a little bit different. He said, I will build my church. And when he started saying that, something got a hold of me. 
something got a hold of everyone in that classroom and, and then he started preaching a little bit he said it's not my church it's not your church it's his church he established it he built it he will grow it and so I, I, I thought about that in church if we can get a hold of that principle and realize that the church belongs to the Lord you see I remember absolutely nothing else about that class except one thing I do remember is that monotone voice that said I will build my church if we can understand that it's the Lord's church it's the Lord's ministry it's the Lord's Sunday school it's the Lord's bus ministry it's the Lord's children's ministry it's the Lord's men's ministry it's the Lord's women's ministry it's the Lord's church let the Lord build his church let the Lord lead his church let the Lord God his church and the church will see revival the church will grow and the church will be victorious in Jesus name when we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, he will rebuild that which has been destroyed and he will build us up and make us into what he wants us to be. Number five, when we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, he will cleanse us from all sin. He will cleanse us from all sin. The people of Jerusalem had sinned. They had disobeyed God. Every time in the history of Israel, when the Jewish people disobeyed the commands of God, their blessing was taken away from them. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, God told the people of Israel, He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. See, God determined for Israel that as long as they were obedient to the word of God, they would experience the blessing of God. But if they were disobedient to the word of God, they were cursed. You see, it's not the will of God for people to be bound in their sin and experience the curse, but he wants them to be set free. He wants them to be blessed. God told Jeremiah in verse 8, he says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me. Even today, when we call on the name of the Lord, when we rely on his strength, God will cleanse us from all of our sin. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's not a single person in this entire world who is perfect. The Bible declares in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sin comes with a great price. When, when laws are broken, there is a price to be paid. When God's law is broken, a price had to be paid, but Jesus has already paid that price. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus paid the price for sin by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary. That was the whole reason that he came into this world to save people from their sins. In John 3, 16 and 17, it says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He cleanses us from our sin. Number six, when we call on the name of the Lord and when we rely on his strength, not only does he cleanse us of all of our sin, but he pardons us from all of our sin. He forgives us and he pardons us. God promised Jeremiah in verse 8 that he would cleanse them from all their sin and their iniquity and pardon all their iniquity. In other words, their record is going to be wiped clean. It would be as if they never sinned in the first place. How is that possible? How is it possible that, that someone can be so lost in sin that they can be so strung out on things of this world? And then the grace of God comes in and washes away their sin and cleanses them of all unrighteousness and he justifies them and he sets them free. And when God looks at their life, they're whiter than snow. How is that possible? It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. That's what the grace of God does. That's what his grace does. See, God did it for the people of Israel and he does it 
for us today in the 21st century. In Psalm chapter 103, verse 3 through 4, in the New Living, it says, He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. Verse 12 says, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. How far is that? How far is that? You know, there is no such thing as the most eastern point of earth. You go east and you keep on going east. You never reach the end of the eastern direction. You can go north as far as you can until you hit the North Pole and then that's it. Then you start going south. You can go south as far as you can, but that's as far south as you can get at the South Pole. Then you're starting to go north again. But as long as you keep going east, you can go east forever and never reach the far east. You can go west forever and never reach the most farther, farthest western point. See, that's how far away our sin has been taken away from us. Our sin is removed from us. As far away as the east is from the west. That means it's never, ever going to be brought up before us again. Number seven, when we call on the name of the Lord and rely on his strength, he will make us a people with a godly reputation. What was once a nation that had turned its back on God in rebellion and, and idolatry and a people that had been held captive for many years was about to experience a change. When the people began to call unto God and when they began to rely totally on his strength, their circumstance began to see a change. Verse 9 of Jeremiah 33 in the New Living, it says, Then this city will bring me joy, glory, and honor before all the nations of the earth. The people of the world will see all the good I do for my people, and they will tremble with awe at the peace and prosperity I provide for them. You see, when people call on the name of the Lord, God is going to answer. He's going to show them great and mighty things, and the divine favor of God is going to be placed upon their life. The Bible is clear in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We've got to pray. It happens every time. When you call on the name of the Lord, he answers. When you call on the name of the Lord, he delivers. When you call on the name of the Lord, he sets the captives free. You see, when you serve the Lord with all your heart, you're going to have a godly reputation. Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God, will be living on the inside of you. And he will be showing on the outside. When Jesus Christ comes to dwell in your life, you will know. Others will know because a Christ-like character will be manifested in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When Jesus Christ comes to live in your life, when he makes a change, it'll be a change like you've never experienced in this world. And as a result, you will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Can we stand together across this sanctuary, please, with every head bowed, every eye closed. Every circumstance that we face in life has an answer. Every problem, every difficulty, every battle that we face, there's always an ending to it. Because Jesus Christ has the ultimate final authority. He already said on the cross of Calvary when he died 2,000 years ago, it is finished. The battle is finished. The war is won. The victory has been accomplished. Healing has already been paid for. All we've got to do is reach out in faith and accept what Jesus Christ has done. Claim that victory. Claim that promise in the all-powerful name of Jesus. Because with God, nothing shall be impossible. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the promise that you've given to us this morning from the word of God. 
Lord, every need that's represented in this church family, Lord, you know all about their circumstance. Lord, you see our struggles. You see our difficulties. You see the battles that we face from day to day in our life. And Lord, we know with you all things are possible. And Father, we place it all in your hand. We give it all into you. For your word declares that you are able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And so, Lord, we give you praise today. And we call upon you. For your word instructs us to, to call unto you. And you will answer and show us great and mighty things that we do not even know about. For, Lord, we thank you, Jesus. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All across the sanctuary this morning, whatever your need, whatever you're going through, you can give it all to Jesus Christ. I'm going to make this altar call as broad as I can possibly give. If you need prayer, regardless of the circumstance, this altar call is for you. You need healing. You need deliverance. You need God to set you free. You need God to anoint you. You need God to strengthen you. If you need salvation, or if you're just hungry and you say, I just want more of Jesus, this altar call is for you. If you're here and you just want to worship God, you want to spend some time waiting in His presence, this altar call is for you. You can stand. You can kneel. But the point is, He says, call unto me and I will answer thee. How can we call unto Him if we don't go to Him in prayer? How can we call unto Him if we don't surrender to His will, surrender to His word? Can we call unto the Lord this morning? Let's come together. Let's find a place and pray and call unto the Lord, for He is worthy. He will answer. He will hear every prayer. He is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. He said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things. Lord, this morning we call unto you. We call unto you today, Father, for you are the source of our strength. You are the strength of our life. In the time of storm, Father, we call on you. In the time of difficulty, we call on you. Father, in everyday life, we call upon you. For God, we're hungry for you, Jesus. We need more of you, Jesus, more of your glory, more of your strength, more of your anointing, more of your power, Jesus. We just want more of you. Blessed be your name.